Okay, my problem. Sorry, now I can hear everybody. All right, thank you, Ahmed. So without further ado, um, uh, people, I want to start and introduce this huddle um, in, with a quote. Um, but first, I want to talk about a few of the people that are involved and in, in how we're going to do things. Um, I've just sort of done my introduction. I'll do another little bit, but really I want to pass it along to them. Um, we have five pretty amazing people, um, all of whom are really, really on the edge, on the cutting edge uh, of various fields within healthcare and medicine. And they all represent aspects of developing areas and really what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask them to first say what they love about their favorite color and then introduce what they feel is their most fun activity. And then part three is really spend a couple minutes talking about what is the most exciting thing coming down the pipeline or they foresee um, in the near future in health and health care. Um, I want to sort of start with cautioning everyone that uh, Yogi Berra once said, the future ain't what it used to be. And I think the present ain't what it is now because things are changing so fast um, that everything we speculate in the position of futurists or presentists might change next year or ne next month. So everything we say with the caveat is our own opinions and uh, the experts have their own opinions and none of them whole are uh, going to be held liable or held to anything that we fantasize about in our discussions. So with that and seeing that it's 4.40, uh, um, I am going to actually stop sharing my screen and have a normal conversation. So I am going to go according to whom I see on my screen. Um, and the first person I see is actually Professor Shoyhit. Molly. Hi. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Joseph, for giving me the opportunity to participate in this August panel discussion. So uh, I know many of you already, and so it's lovely to see you again. Um, okay, so you asked for my favorite color. Um, I would say my favorite color is red. And I think I like red because it's so vibrant and alive. And you asked for my favorite activity. And I really like living in Canada and embracing winter. And I love to downhill ski. So I think I love to downhill ski just because it's fun and you cannot be connected when you're downhill skiing. Otherwise you might crash into somebody. So it gives my brain a time to relax and reflect and, um, and then it's just fun and it's fun to go fast. Although if you know how, if you know me, you know how fast I ski, you'll be like, really not so fast. Um, lastly, <laughs> Thanks for laughing at my jokes. Um, did you want me to talk about um, um, sort of my view for the future now or, or wait for, oh, wait, I can't hear you. Let's mention one thing about the future. What is, are you most excited about? Where do you see things going from your well, vantage? Yeah, so um, I, I have uh, the privilege to be a professor in um, engineering at the University of Toronto and, and work at that intersection of engineering and medicine. And, um, you know, so we do a lot of work in regenerative medicine and also in, um, you know, so cell and drug delivery strategies. And I think, um, and then I've had the opportunity also to uh, commercialize or translate some of our inventions into the private sector and started some companies. So I think what I'm really excited about the future of medicine is combination strategies. So instead of depending on, on one thing to solve, um, you know, these complex medical problems that we're trying to overcome, it's uh, looking at those combinations. 
And so from a very you know, broad perspective, the combination could be of uh, two different drug molecules. Mm -hmm. It could be the combination of um, you know, active rehabilitation with drug therapies. It could be electrical stimulation and drug therapies. But I do think that we really have to go beyond the single therapy to multimodal therapies. Um, so that's something I'm really excited about the future. I, I recognize that makes the clinical trials a lot more complicated. Um, so not, not as easily done as said, but I'm really excited about that as, as, the, as a future opportunities. Thank you. So um, I'm torn uh, with the mention of clinical trials. Vicky comes up right away, but uh, uh, Professor Dr. Ma Mandami um, is also involved in clinical trials. At least that's how we met, I forget how many years ago now um, at UHN. So why don't you go first and then we'll go to Vicky. Great. Thank you also for inviting me to this wonderful session. Um, I guess my favorite color I would say is probably gray. Um, and it, I know it sounds so depressing, but I actually really like it because I think it's really versatile. And I think it's kind of classy. Um, so what do I really like doing? Uh, the younger me would have said, I love playing soccer or football for the rest of the world outside of North America. But nowadays, I think I'm just, uh, my daughter keeps telling me I'm too old. So I actually still like to play video games. And she says I'm too old to do that too, but uh, I still enjoy it. And then I think the one thing around the future, um, I would say I'm just going to leave it very simple and say I'm really looking forward to artificial intelligence leading to more human care. Now, that has nothing to do with your role, does it, by any chance? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Future's AI. <laughs> what an interesting coincidence. Um, so um, clearly, um, you're one of the AI people here that will speak to it. But um, I want to just ask people to, if you can, uh, turn on your cameras. One of the things I find that makes even online uh, conversations a little better is seeing people's reactions. It's really hard when you're just seeing black squares. So get into the mood if you can. I know some of you are in hospitals or in other places where you may not be able to turn on cameras. We don't mind kids or dogs or cats. We had a cat today unmute somebody uh, by accident. So Vicki, let's turn to you. Uh, uh, well, good afternoon, Joseph. Thanks for inviting me. It's, it's really good to see you um, and to see everybody who's participating. Um, our neighbors in Canada who we haven't been able to go see very much lately. <laughs> um, uh, my favorite color is purple. And uh, I, I actually also like gray. I painted just painted my house gray, almost everything inside it, two shades of gray. And it looks great. I agree with you and classy. Purple would definitely not work on the walls. Um, but I do like purple. I think I like purple because it's a blend um, of red and blue. Uh, and it has many meanings, uh, political in our country. And that's not actually why I like it. But I don't know, it, it just, um, ever since I'm a kid, I, I've always had an affinity for purple, purple flowers, purple everything. Um, and I think it is because it combines two other colors that I like a lot. Um, my favorite things to do, I don't know, there's a lot of things, but I think probably is travel, uh, in particular with my family, um, with my sons. I have three sons. Uh, all in college right now. And uh, it's really fun now that they're older to, to go on different adventures with them. Two great trips lately. A couple of years ago, we did a safari in South Africa. It was really wonderful. And, um, and we really like to go to Hawaii a lot. I would say Hawaii is one of my favorite places on the planet. So when I'm in Hawaii, I'm happy. Uh, there's so many different things to do. Different climates, different adventures, different natural beauty. It's just really a paradise place. Future. Um, I agree on the, the AI side. I, I would say um, what I see as the future is how to give uh, patients and their families 
uh, more tools that help them take charge of their own medical destiny. Um, and I think that that's true for participation in clinical trials. I also think it's true for participating in one's own healthcare, where from my perspective, um, there's been a major shift lately with COVID that's kind of exciting and that everybody has become med medically educated to a new level, the entire world. And I think it's setting a new foundation for how people can become more engaged in participating with physicians and others in managing their own healthcare destiny. And I, I think that it's necessary because as Molly pointed out, the therapies are going to get more complicated and we need to play a part in that. So I think that digital tools are part of helping people do that. And then, as I said, this kind of newly educated uh, general public. Uh, I'm an immunologist and it's so interesting for me to go out to any place now and have people talking to me about antibodies and T cells. <laughs> so, um, Maybe that's some good that will come out of the pandemic. So I, I, I'm flabbergasted by the coincidence that you believe in people taking charge of their own medical records and the name of your company being my own. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, wow, what a coincidence. Um, I'd like to uh, turn over to Brian next. Um, so... Uh, doctor, uh, professor, surgeon, uh, innovator, uh, entrepreneur, and many, many other adjectives um, who has already spoken at huddles, but has so much to say, he, we can't limit him to one. Go. What's your favorite color? So blue. Um, blue is my favorite color. Uh, and uh, favorite thing to do um, I've got three daughters, uh, and uh, any chance there is to wrestle or throw them in a snowbank or ski fast with them, uh, those are the kind of things that we like to do. When it snowed 40 centimeters here last week, all they wanted to do was go outside and be thrown in the snowbank repeatedly for 90 minutes. And that's my workout. That's my family time. Um, it's, uh, it's a good time. And in terms of, um, you know, future stuff, there's so much. I mean, you know, a lot of it is what we make of it, right? Um, but uh, I do see, you know, you can look at it from two sides. You can look at it from the science side, what are the enabling sciences? And then you can look at it from what does the healthcare system really need right now? And uh, when you look at it from what the healthcare system really needs right now, you know, it's healthcare, human resources. Um, it's getting people to look after themselves at home and participate in their care, not just for their own good, but also for the good of the system. Um, and so I think that, um, I, I think there's there's those two real angles uh, to it uh, that come to my mind. And then uh, when it comes to enabling, enabling technologies, there are quite a few of them. I mean, you've got experts here in tissue engineering and artificial intelligence. Um, I think uh, immunosciences, uh, xenotransplantation just made huge news. Imagine the dialysis ward disappearing because you didn't need to do dialysis anymore. I mean, that would just be phenomenal, right? And, um, and I think there's also, you know, a big part of life sciences in the past 30 years has been pharma and biotech. Um, and I, I almost look at those as subscription therapies where you, you get subscribed to them and you're committed to them and they cost a lot. Um, and I think that it's hard to manage complexity when you're on massive amounts of polypharmacy. So maybe we can all tolerate five or six or seven drugs when we're in our 70s or 80s to manage our cardiovascular disease and our hypertension and a former cancer of some sort to keep it suppressed. Um, and maybe a thrombotic condition thrown in there that you need to be on a blood thinner for. You know, all those things will interact with each other. And um, over the course of time, there'll be complications that come from some of them. So thinking about permanent solutions um, that can potentially um, find alternative solutions uh, so that you can at least minimize one or two or three agents on that polypharmacy list, I think is going to be an inevitable requirement as we get older, because you can't just keep piling on the list of things that you have to take every day um, indefinitely. Um, so... Uh, those are my high level thoughts. I can go into deep detail on any of them. One correction though, I'm not a surgeon. The surgeons would not want me to be called a surgeon because uh, I don't cut it. <laughs> <Cardiologist>. <laughs> um, 
I, I do lots of minimally invasive procedures. <laughs> My miss, I'm sorry, I uh, associated you with Brad and old age moment, I think. He's you not know, a surgeon either. <laughs> <laughs> He's an interventional cardiologist, minimally invasive procedures, keyhole surgery, keyhole procedures. Uh, uh, point taken. Um, okay, so we have some introductions. The point is we have a, about eight minutes to start conversations going. Then we're going to break out into much smaller rooms. There are about... 60 people joining us, so probably about six rooms to talk about various things randomly and talk and get to know one another. So before we go there, I'm going to open this up to anyone out there. Um, I don't actually see David O'Neill yet. I was hoping that he would uh, sort of uh, talk about his role uh, in commercializing uh, in pharmaceutical interventions. Um, which is what uh, his organization specializes in, actually, um, which would have been a nice uh, follow-up to Brian. Um, so, David, if you're out there in the audience and I'm not seeing you as part of the panel, let me know, and we'll we'll get you uh, talking. Otherwise, um, to all of the panelists, so I heard, actually, um, following on Brian's comment, that really we're looking at several key divergences. One is about the empowerment of the individual. So we have enabling technologies that so somehow magically in a black box is going to allow us to monitor ourselves or advocate for ourselves and provide data for these magic boxes that AI is going to scrutinize. So that seems to be one pillar of where growth is going. Another is these new kinds of uh, genetic interventions or interventions dealing with ch changing the body. And the third one that I heard with Molly's work um, is kind of um, at the intersection of materials. So it's not, it's sort of, if I may, in, in my simple layman's unknowing language, uh, the, the uh, sort of interjection into boundaries of the human body with um, changes that we want to make. So does anyone want to comment about these? Are, am I sort of, as a layman, getting an understanding of the thrusts you, you are talking about? I'll just pick up on the last thing you brought up because it, um, I think it's a really interesting concept, uh, at least the way I'm interpreting what you're saying, which is this idea of almost, you know, remember the, I don't know, lots of people in the audience are probably too young to remember like the $6 million man, right? Like the, or the biotic woman, you know, and those, those TV shows were about, I know, do, 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 do. so <laughs> take me back. I won't sing anymore, but you know, that those ideas of building people back to be superhuman. And so, you know, in this idea of um, using regenerative medicine, for example, to, or tissue engineering to not just stop disease progression and reverse it, but maybe build it back better, so to speak. So build it back without disease. I mean, I think that's a huge opportunity. It's extremely difficult to achieve, but it's also, you know, if we're gonna think big and think about opportunities, that, that certainly is a great opportunity to think about building sort of this idea of building it back better. Um, and, you know, the, the idea of, you know, AI and device, like all these things and remote care, they all come into play, um, you know, into what we th we're thinking about the future, but but certainly that is a very future. Even though <laughs> the TV show was so long ago, um, that futuristic idea, and not, maybe not being electronic, but being tissue based, cell based, um, would certainly be uh, fascinating and exciting to to deliver on that promise. Yes, uh, so I, I sort of was, was alluding to that. Sort of, there have been futurists uh, at Google, at MIT, that talked about sort of the boundaries of the body. And usually it's about us escaping 
the body in some way. But I think you're absolutely right. What we're doing now is rewriting the body and re-engineering the body. And so that seems to be one of the major areas of future focus. Um, what about you, Vicky, in terms of, um, and, and maybe Mohammed together, because you're dealing with empowerment and the movement of information and its analysis. Like this well, seems- Yeah, sort of I mean, I think it fits with what, with what Molly was saying, right? Which is part of what I think we need to do is define what's important to, to us in our, in how we age, in our disease management, et cetera, and how the therapies or the interventions that we are using um, can facilitate the life we want to lead. I also think that we have to be in part of figuring out our own, working with you know healthcare professionals, obviously, but part of what we need to do is figure out, help figure out our own diagnosis because we're getting down to much finer definitions of disease and um, deeper understandings. And it goes to polypharmacy, it goes to everything. Not every hypertensive person is the same and needs the same medication. Some may not need any medication, you know, and how they want to manage, how they will work with their healthcare team to manage things. There's still so many mysteries, particularly in um, neurology and the brain right now that we need to work through. And I think this is where regenerative medicine plays such an important part, but so many diseases that are autoimmune or neurological in nature that require so much from the patient to explain their experience. And, and I, I keep coming back to COVID because I think right now we're dealing with this playing out at the global scale where we've been trying to really figure out, and I've been involved in this at many levels, what these different symptomatic presentations are what they mean when they're presenting acutely and what do they mean for long-term consequences and what is this longer-term COVID you know, syndrome that we're seeing and how that's playing out. And, and this is being defined primarily by patients working with the healthcare community because this was starting with a blank slate. And if we look at, again, the pandemic as an example that I think is just so game-changing, it's an awareness of public health. It's an awareness of patients as participants in defining the disease, patients going out and getting their own diagnoses, not part of the medical record, I might add, managing their, you know, 90% of medical management of COVID is happening outside the healthcare system, not in the EMRs. Um, so, you know, thinking about how we are having more agency and how we need to be part of this and Regenerative medicine, I think, is a perfect example because what do we want from it? It's a very pers usually very personalized therapies. I think it's going to upend manufacturing to a local, you know, not the pharmaceutical-based model, where we're again creating things that are more local, cottage industries, more driven by, you know, participants working with physicians at locally to develop these therapies kind of together. And I couldn't agree more about polypharmacy. I'm, actually going through this personally with my mother right now, who's right now a medical mystery at Johns Hopkins Clinic. <laughs> Part of what we're doing is cutting a lot of medications. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, these, are, these are all game-changing uh, elements. And certainly clinical trials will be changed by it um, as well. How we approach clinical trials, how we approach studying new therapeutic interventions. Yeah, I think just to follow on the clinical trials thing and, and our knowledge and our precision of diagnostics, right? Um, so Canada is really strong at image-guided therapy. That's part of what I'm involved with, both from a research perspective and from a, a company perspective. And when you go and you actually look at a disease and it's not, okay, let's not just fight cancer, but we're fighting like a hundred different entities as kind of their fundraising thing for the Canadian Cancer Society right now, that there, there's so many variants of every disease, coronary disease, there's so many variants of how coronary disease prevent, presents itself and what its causes are and what its manifestations are. So when you think about trials and you think about how we're going to recruit people, we're used to recruiting people who have a disease that is very broad out there that a lot of people have in common. But as we get more and more knowledge about what how people are presenting and what the true pathobiology underneath um, their presentation is, it's almost like we're going to 
have to find better paths to figure out sooner rather than relying on 10,000 patient randomized controlled trials, what's the best way to treat this subgroup? And how do we identify those people and put them into some sort of a, a knowledge generating path um, that allows us to learn which paths are the right ones to treat them with in the future? So I think there's going to be a fair bit of, of change in terms of not putting everybody into a big bucket and hoping for a one or two percent absolute difference between you know, people who got treated and people who didn't, but it's actually going to be a myriad of 20 or 30 different buckets that people get put into and almost having to learn on the fly in a bit of a bootstrap fashion as to how to, how, what worked well, and, and then maybe a few variants that we observed where, hey, that particular decision of a treatment, whether it was giving a particular drug or doing a particular intervention, that didn't work out so well. So let's not repeat that again um, if we see that happen on, if there's a signal that's starting to get generated from that. Mohammed, your thoughts on that kind of a, a thought process around diagnostics and how we're going to change how we generate knowledge about how to do things better going forward? Yeah, I mean, we could spend hours on this. Um, but, you know, I, I've kind of maybe stepping back a little bit, um, you know, when Vicky was talking about her, uh, her mom being a mystery at Johns Hopkins, if we kind of step back, and this is all philosophical, so I hate to get philosophical on you guys, but if we step back a little bit and we think a little bit about how much we know, um, right. I mean, it, it, look at the body's composition. Yeah, the body's composition. Uh, we have anywhere from 70 to 100 trillion cells in our body. Right. Each one of these cells has about 100 trillion atoms in it. Each one of those cells. So if you believe in chaos theory and the butterfly effect, like all it takes is one thing to happen and then you have disease. And if you step back um, or if you step forward a little bit, uh, we know, best estimates, I think, are around, we know of about a little over 10,000 diseases. Uh, I think in the World Health Organization, they have the highest estimate of maybe 30,000 diseases. So let's say we know of 30,000 diseases. There are way more out there that we have no idea about. Right? And if you actually think a little bit more about it, U.S. FDA uh, treatments uh, that are approved by the FDA, 500, 500 diseases out of the 10 or 30,000. If we really understood these diseases, we would have treatments for them. And these are not cures, these are just treatments. So we know really of a fraction of these things, right? And healthcare is incredibly complex. And, and if you think about our decision-making process around how do you make a diagnosis? Some things are fairly straightforward, but most things aren't. So how do we make a diagnosis? Well, you know, we poke at the blood, right? And we, we draw a blood sample and we look at lab values. We do some medical imaging, you know, uh, take a look there. Uh, does it get down to the cellular level, the, the atomic level? Absolutely not. These are very crude instruments, right? Blood draws and images and stuff. We're only touching the surface of what's actually happening. And then we're processing it in our little brains to say, I think this is what the diagnosis is based on symptoms, family history, medical imaging labs. This is what I think that I, and we get it wrong a lot, right? How often have we misdiagnosed asthma? It's pretty common. Right. Um, so we go from diagnosis. And then, of course, how the heck do I treat this patient? Well, we have to then think about prognosis, because if this patient's going to do fairly poorly, rapidly, our treatment strategy changes relative to this patient having a lot more time to work with. Maybe we're a bit more conservative on our treatment and management approach. We have no idea what the prognosis is most of the time. We're awful at that. And there's tons of studies to say that we really, really are poor at prognosis. But that's what we do when we treat patients. So there's lots and lots of room for improvement. Um, and I think this is where, uh, again, the, the, human, the average human mind can process seven plus or minus two things at the same time, right? And I think there's some gurus out there who say the average complex medical decision involves a thousand different processes to consider. There's no way we can actually deal with it on our own. That's why I'm kind of optimistic about the AI angle. But going back to, to Brian's point, you know, this whole concept of clinical trials versus personalized medicine and such. Clinical trials are great. I think you need them to be tested uh, for, uh, for therapies to be tested and such. But man, I, I've went down the route of observational epidemiology to clinical trials, and now I'm right back into personalized medicine and AI types of approaches because the clinical trial will tell you what to do for the average patient. And keep in mind, seven, what, 80 to 90% of trials? Um, but no, sorry, most, the average trial will, um, not include 80 to 90% of the patient that you would, the patient population you would typically see. You'd exclude them. 
So it's ludicrous, but this is what we do. We take a randomized trial and try and apply it to all our patients. It's insane. So can you really take the average result and apply it to a patient who's just not average? And that's where you kind of come full circle and say, all right, we need trials. They play a role. But when you're talking about actual individualized patient care, it's a different approach I think we need to take. Um, and we're still trying to figure it out, I think. Yeah, I, I don't think we can be entirely reductionist to the point where we understand what's going on at every, at all the way down to that level of detail. And we have to take the patterns that we learn from these studies. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as we think about how we manage people, there's a saying I really like, which is, um, in general, generalizations generally do not apply. So, um, <laughs> there's, so there's, everyone's different, everyone's special. And so, you know, we need to be able to recognize these cases and that's where a lot of experience in physicians comes from and where group decisions and tumor boards or heart team rounds come into play where you get opinions from many people with broad ranges of experiences to try and come up with the best path because it's hard to come up with that as an individual and, and kind of that whole concept of team-based decision making and bringing panels of experts together which often includes the patient and their families um, um, but uh, often also just includes healthcare professionals um, you know, that's, that's one of the things that's enabled in part by remote medicine technologies. I mean, every patient who goes to the cap, to, goes to the operating room at Sunnybrook goes through a heart team process. And there are literally 10 doctors reviewing every patient two times a week before they go to the operating room to choose the best care path for them. And I think it's had a market impact on their outcomes. Yeah, I think one thing I'd add about clinical trials in the future is adaptability. I think that we really need to move into um, more advanced mathematical, mathematically based clinical trials where we're building in priors, Bayesian methods, adaptability, um, so that we're taking data as it's coming in in real time, which we can do now, failing faster and moving people into different treatment arms, even with the crude tools that we have in randomized control trials, we can do them much better if we build in more of these adaptations, um, which would allow us to subset um, at the front end as well as subset as we move through the trials. And I know this is kind of antithetical to some of the things that are typical in drug approval, but I think it's completely necessary. And um, I believe that it will happen um, in the near future because it has to. And we are at the point where we can start thinking about sort of these umbrella trials with, with conditional branching based on, you know, uh, AI and generated uh, numbers. So when David Jaffrey was here before he left us for Texas, um, he used to talk about um, that we are essentially sitting in the hospitals are data lakes. And the problem is that we right now cannot really look at the contents of those lakes enough and in ways that will allow us to understand how to treat the patients in the future. And so clinical trials are one piece, uh, but I, I, I know Pat just asked a, a little while ago a question, when do we move beyond clinical trials what, how do these new technologies, and maybe Pat, if you will unmute yourself because I'm not doing your question justice. Um, Pat uh, is now retired, but has spent over 30 years as a clinician and director of innovation at Southlake Hospital. Yeah, th thank you, Joseph. Can, can folks hear me? I'm, I'm trying to do this on my phone at the moment. Am I coming through all right? Yeah, we hear you, Pat. Yeah, okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah, you know, my, my, my question, and I don't want to sidetrack from, from, from science, but, um, you know, I, I was listening to, you know, kind of some of the conversation about, you know, regenerative medicine, um, you know, the, 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 the exponential opportunity in technology. You know, I was thinking a little bit about the, the sort of the coal face of, of where, you know, that technology um, both needs to drive new delivery models in terms of, of, of how healthcare is, is delivered. Um, 
but but not only drives it, but but also has to respond to existing models. So whether that's you know that's payment models, whether that's relationship. Um, so so just curious for folks way way smarter than I am around how that how how our 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 boundless ability to to think and and create technology and and have technology you know far superior to what we had yesterday or the day before let alone you know 10 years ago or, or 20 years ago how that integrates with actual models of delivering that technology and so i just i was curious about those more existential thoughts about how, how those two things work together what drives what what leads what how do you how do you move that forward in terms of systems people practitioners um curiosity that's all don't forget provincial debt. That's a big one. Don't and, and yeah, that's <laughs> not a provincial debt, sure. Who, who, who pays? I, well, you know, I don't know who pays, but I like Vicky's um, answer. I thought she actually started to answer your question uh, when, you know, she was talking about, Vicky, you can expand on this because I don't want to speak for you because you're right here. But this idea of um, local and, you know, um, if it's personal, then it's using perhaps, you know, we already think about using um, people's own cells, reprogramming their own cells. There's platelet rich plasma, which comes out of yourself and goes back into you, you know? So there, I think there's already steps towards personalized medicine, um, but, I, but I do agree. I think it will, it has to change everything we do. I don't know, Vicki, do you want to expand? Because I was kind of expanding on some of the things you had said. Well, I, I mean, I think that, you know, the system, uh, and I, I'm not going to speak, I think Canada does a much better job <laughs> than we do here in the United States, but the system is so difficult um, to navigate, just the, just the operational components. So in order for I think these more advanced therapies to um, find their place. Um, we have to do a better job. The same for clinical trials. I mean, the amount of money spent on recruiting is ridiculous. There are patients that are in the clinics every day that would benefit from participation in these studies. And, you know, pharmaceutical companies are out spending enormous amounts of money to try to, you know, build Facebook groups so they can find the perfect patient. And it, it goes to the point that was made before by Muhammad, we have to learn to do trials at point of care. We have to learn how to build models that allow us to do things at point of care. We need to diversify. We need to take into account where people live and what their life is like. And, and you know, we can do this with the data. Um, and, you know, I, I think we need to understand at least here in the US how broken the system is for the average patient to navigate um, even simple things that are workflows. I mean, I'm talking to doctors at major academic medical centers who are asking me to build applications so that they can find patients in the halls because they wheel them up for you know imaging and nobody knows where they are. <laughs> and it's like, you know, we could just put a tag on them so that there's a checklist when the person was dropped off, where they are now. And I'm like, you know, this is crazy, but I'm experiencing it, you know, right now with, with my mother's care, which is terrific. I'm not, you know, but there's so many points along the way of, I think, operationalizing that um, could be streamlined. And we always talk a lot about AI and data from the perspective of research and understanding disease, but we also need it to deliver healthcare more effectively. I mean, we saw this again, I hate to keep coming back to COVID, but how fast we built the vaccines and then we couldn't get them to the people. You know, I mean, it, it's just perfect example in my mind of, where operations break down. So I, I feel like we need to pay as much attention to that as we do to, you know, the types of therapies we're delivering, but it, it's also how do we set up the system to incorporate the patient, to make it easy, make it easy for the healthcare delivery, you know, people, the, the doctors, the nurses, and make it easier for the patients. Because right now it's pretty hard. I got to tell you, <laughs> you know, I mean, just some basic things that are, are really difficult um, to get done. You know, I think um, 
there's a few things that are happening that are here and now that are indicative of where we're going to go and the stressors from COVID have certainly added on to this. Um, but I probably see, I used to see all my patients in clinic and do a full exam on them. I'm now, you know, 15% of my patients are coming in. I was trying to get a higher number of people coming in in person and then Omicron came along and we were told to send everybody back out of the hospital again. Um, but, you know, we're looking after patients with COVID and sending them home with an oxygen tank and a pulse oximeter and just calling them instead of them taking up a bed in the hospital. They're going home, and if there's any negative prognosticator that comes up on their daily assessment, yeah, we'll bring them in and find a bed for them. But the ease of looking after somebody at home where you don't have to feed them, you don't have to make sure their television works, where they're not complaining about somebody in the room next to them who you know, is either confused or had a code blue or some way doesn't, doesn't work for them it's so much easier to look after people at home if they can tolerate it. And it's just easier for the family to be there with them as well, especially with isolation protocols right now. So I think a big transformation in hospitals is gonna be that they really are gonna be limited to things where you're bleeding or you need an operation or you're incredibly immunocompromised and so absolutely frail or critically ill. Um, and then a lot of the stuff that does get treated um, in hospitals is gonna be done uh, remotely. Uh, and your drugs will get delivered to you by a little, I don't know, Uber driver or something like that, and you'll self-administer them and that kind of thing. So I, I think um, I think that'll be a big change. Um, uh, I think the healthcare human resources is just massive. Um, we uh, can't, um, uh, uh, you know, find enough people to do the kind of work that we need to do <laughs> in the hospital right now to do hip surgeries, to do cardiac care, to do to staff the emergency room. So um, finding ways to relieve the burden and to use their time efficiently is going to be really important. And, you know, you can imagine that as we move along as a society and we get older and we learn more um, and some of the commodities that we need in life um, become more affordable um, and more available, we're going to end up spending a greater percentage of our healthcare, of our dollars on healthcare. And does that all have to come through the government? You know, this is a very sensitive question. This is a very difficult question to raise in Canada, but I think it's one that has to be raised because we can't, I don't think the government can do everything and nor do I think necessarily the government doing everything always encourages the best behavior to avoid getting sick in the first place. So there are some, big challenges that we're gonna to have to think about culturally along with this, um, along with the epidemiologic constraints that are on with us now, as well as with the technological innovations that are happening that yes, enable us to do more, but, but how, how much do we spend when we get into our seventh presentation with a critical illness on a new therapy that might cost hundred thousand dollars to get us two more years of life? Like these are things we really need to think about because they are here and now and they displace treatment for someone else that maybe just needs a prophylactic medication to help them get through their teenage years, right? So there's a lot of uh, a lot of big governance questions uh, coming down the pipeline along with this technology. You know, maybe if I can ask a very focused question to, to uh, Mohammed from an AI perspective, because people talk about AI as if it's going to solve everything. And it's not. It's got a lot of limitations to it. You know, one of the things I think 30% of healthcare dollars are spent on things that are not productive in terms of advancing human health. So hopefully AI will help us identify some of that. And some people come up with very big, grandiose expectations that, hey, if you just throw a whole bunch of data at the world's largest you know, cryptocurrency powered neural network that it's going to like, you, know, you can take all these GPUs that are used to mine cryptocurrency and do really deep convoluted neural networks on them. And, and maybe you can solve all the problems if all the data is there. But I think there's got to be a level of focus because because Watson Health really failed this whole big billion dollar project with IBM. It really failed because we didn't end up focusing on questions that were solvable and were meaningful and were interpretable. So thoughts on any of those random comments I just made there, Mohammed? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and yeah, AI can solve everything, right? Um, <laughs> the reality is. Uh, AI is only going to learn what you teach it uh, through the data that's available. And so if your data aren't there, if they're not in uh, uh, the right quantity, quality, um, structure, it's not going to learn. Um, so it's very, very limited in terms of uh, what its capabilities are, much more limited than people think. 
And so in our own personal experience, and, and we, I think, filter quite well, um, for every 10 questions we get, maybe two or three of them, we could, we could reasonably uh, do something with around analytics and AI. In a lot of cases, it's not even machine learning and AI. It's, it's basic data stats and analysis and such. So um, I, I think you have to have your expectations around. There are a lot of problems we're just going to have to shrug our shoulders around and say there aren't any trials. There's no data-driven type thing because we don't collect the data for it. We don't have it. We're just going to have to take our best guess. And that's okay because that's what we used to do, right? And that's what we still should kind of do. That it doesn't mean we try and get better and collect more data and actually be better. Of course we should, we should advance. But the reality is we're not going to be able to address everything with data and AI. I think the other thing uh, to Pat's point is um, for every, I don't know, let's say 10 good ideas that we can do something with, not all of them are going to be deployable. So I can't tell you, uh, there's so many stories. Uh, so we're very fortunate. We have a pretty high success rate and that's because we're very particular in terms of what we develop and deploy at our hospital. But I would say that um, what I hear is that for every 10 great ideas, maybe one or two can be deployed. And we have um, one example of a failure just recently where we have a terrific algorithm perform really, really well. And um, the, the clinicians who are saying we need to do this we made a mistake of not checking with the other clinicians that work with that group. And they said, absolutely not. So this is very much a social issue. <laughs> it's, it's a people issue and people have to want to change. People have to want to actually do something differently. Uh, that's the only way you're gonna get deployment. So the AI solution can do its job and you can have a wonderful algorithm and a solution, but if people don't want it or there's not a need for it or people are threatened or scared by it, there are other examples that I've heard from my colleagues where they've tried to deploy solutions that will eliminate 30% uh, of a department. Yeah, guess who said no? The department, right? Because they're gonna lose jobs. Um, so it, all sorts of social political considerations and such. I would say that we have to, at the end of the day, be realistic people who are thoughtful, uh, have common sense <laughs> and try and, and make the best with what we have, looking forward to advances as, as they're allowed to be made. I don't know. I, I, I don't know, Mohammed. I, I know you're the, the expert, but I beg to differ. I have it on good authority that um, Skynet and other AIs are going to be taking over the world and going well beyond our current capabilities. Um, so in, uh, I, I, I almost hate to stop this conversation because it, it, I think it's, it's very fruitful, but I also want to break down into smaller groups so we can talk more face to face. So those of you with black squares, get ready to turn on your cameras. We're going to go into smaller huddles so that we can actually drill down and talk about. I know some of you are your own are experts, entrepreneurs, patients, clinicians. So time for you to jump into the conversation. So with that, Sophie, may I call upon you to split up uh, everybody? You'll have facilitators in each of the rooms to help uh, hopefully uh, maintain the conversation. But ask your questions. Um, the future is bright, despite Skynet. Okay, so uh, you will get an invitation. You've all used Zoom before uh, to join your breakout room. I'll stay out for a little bit. So in case uh, someone uh, gets lost, just pop out, let me know. And uh, yeah, we'll see you all back here in a bit. <laughs> 